So what we're going to talk about today are the three philosophies of China. Those philosophies are influence both dynasties, political, cultural expectations. And so we can't divorce them from their culture and political context. However, what we are going to do is try to distill just what do these philosophies believe. And once we distill them, kind of understand that, then we'll be able to back up and look at how this, these play out in dynasties and how they play out in cultural norms and artistic expression. So what we're going to begin with is the philosophy of Confucianism. Uh, of all the philosophies, this continues in the largest and most noticeable way to influence China and other Asian countries. Confucianism was begun by a man called Confucius, and he was writing in about 500s BC, around the same time as Buddha and Isaiah uh, over in Israel. So a, a, neck, a time of incredible philosophical change and ideas. According to Confucius, you as a person live within a community and you have certain expectations for living properly with the various people in that community. That means that you need to know what consists of a proper relationship, what is virtue and good character, and how that orders society. In other words, because he believes that people, somewhat because of his environment and the requirement of the people to all work together in order to survive. Because of that environmental context, as well as other political expectations, Confucius believes it's not about who you are individually, but how you fit within a web of connectedness and where you fit within the community and the family that gives you value and gives your community the opportunities to survive. And so the focus is becoming a noble person, a noble man, and nobleness is defined in knowing how to relate with other people, no matter who they are. And so there, that nobleness will relate to people regardless of who they are, you'll know where you fit in that relationship. Okay, so some specific examples. All that is based around five categories of relationship that Confucius explains. He explains that there are five categories and regardless of who is the top person in that category, they are expected to protect and provide while the people underneath are expected to respect and obey. If one side doesn't do it, you're still expected to follow, but there are then questions in terms of whether they continue to deserve the right to be followed. Those five relationships are as follows. While the king and the people are going to have the greatest implications to Confucius, the foundational relationship were the father and the son. This concept of filial piety, of the son supporting and following after the father, was very important to Confucius. And the, that became the foundation for the other relationships, such as husband to wife, king to people, friend to friend, brother to brother. In the case of friend and brother, it's all based on age. So whoever's older respects, sorry, whoever is older provides, while the person who's younger respects. The concept is that while you're continuing to respect the older, higher people in your family and also your society, the country will retain order. And this is very much connected. It should remind you of ancestor worship, which of course implicates into the mandate of heaven and the concept that then the king and even the father receives that legitimization for power by providing for the people. And as long as he is being noble, then he is able to be obeyed and continue in his dynastic rule. So basically, if we were to sum up Confucianism, it's all about being in a relationship. And what relationship is it? And how does that relationship defined? The second philosophy is very different. It is much less political, much more artistic. Even you'll see it more believed and followed by the lower classes or more the artists in society. And it's Taoism. Now, you'll notice that sometimes it's called tap. It has the T. Sometimes it has the D. That's because of the transliteration systems, which we can explain in greater detail at another time. But that's why you've got both options there. Taoism is begun by a man called Lao Tzu. And his approach is the idea that you are striving for effortless action. Very different than nobility. You are seeking to do 
by not doing. You are seeking to learn the flow of nature and to become part of nature as a person. And that force of nature, known as chi, and those spirits which are flowing through and throughout nature and in you, if you're going against it, you're going to be in trouble. So instead, you need to go through and with that force of nature. And if you can, while going with the nature, not do anything, you are doing something because you are part of that natural force. So basically, in Taoism, you need to go with the flow. You need to go with the chi as it, as it carries you through into nature. This ties in with this very famous symbol, the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang is the idea, again, Think about effortless action, those opposites which actually fit together. And the yin and the yang argues that it's not opposites. They're not against one another. In fact, they complement one another. You can't have something without nothing. Just briefly, so the yin is the female and that is the dark side. Uh, basically, the colors are the opposite of an, from an American wedding. So while in an American wedding, the woman wears white. The black is female, white is male, uh, and it, it's not evil versus good. It's opposites, dark versus light, force versus not force, strength versus weakness, etc. I think the easiest example is the case of a bull. What makes a bull? Well, is it the firmness, the hard edges, or is it in fact the emptiness inside that makes it most useful? That's the concept of yin, yin and yang, hard and empty, something and nothing necessary to create nature itself. So that's Taoism briefly. Uh, it does influence art predominantly. We're gonna, we, we'll go in more detail into that later. Uh, but one aspect of this is the concept of feng shui, which is how you rearrange your home so that the qi, that energy is flowing freely through your home. A totally opposite philosophy is that of legalism. So we've seen Confucianism, more political, but still social. You've seen Taoism, which is much more artistic, and then legalism, which is simply about government. Legalism works on two premises, started by the guy Han Fei. The premise is people are evil, society needs order, and therefore the king needs to be strict and harsh. If you don't have a strict and harsh king, people will overrun it, and then you will no longer have a society with order. Han Fei is writing during the Warring States period after the Zhao dynasty has fallen apart. And so you can kind of understand where he's coming from. And he basically wants a king who will establish strong enough order, who will unify China and keep China unified. And so you could summarize his concept is my way or the highway. Those are the three philosophies. Pretty basic. Confucianism, all about being a relation in a relationship in society. Taoism, all about going with the flow of nature. And legalism, following the king's way or taking the highway out of there to maybe another country.